this time, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Felipe Santos to the podium. Dr. Felipe Santos is the Academic Director for the INSEAD Social Entrepreneurship <coughs> Initiative, and he is going to provide us with an overview of core concepts related to impact investing to help establish a common language and framework from which we can all build over the course of the next two days. Dr. Santos. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm humbled by the opportunity to be here and help open uh, these, these gatherings, this amazing gathering. Uh, the people here, the potential for change is enormous, um, and it's a very exciting opportunity. Um, just for you too, so this is a very pompous title, Core Concept and Framework for Analysis. I'll try to be much simpler, uh, but also more provocative in what I intend to say. And just for you to have a sense of who is in, in front of you, I'm a, an economist from Portugal, uh, very passionate about entrepreneurship, um, I did my PhD at Stanford University around entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, and uh, then I joined INSEAD, the business school based in Europe and Singapore and now Abu Dhabi as well, uh, because I wanted to promote the practice of entrepreneurship throughout the world. Um, and it happened that uh, about seven years ago, I came across this new field of social entrepreneurship. At the time, we didn't speak about impact investing, but social entrepreneurship. And I met a few social entrepreneurs. And I became so passionate about what you were doing that I decided to change my entire research and teaching from entrepreneurship, commercial entrepreneurship, to social entrepreneurship. In that process, I became director at INSEAD for the INSEAD Social Entrepreneurship Program, an executive education program we have for social entrepreneurs, in the course of which, over seven years, I, I train and learn from more than 500 social entrepreneurs. And a lot of what I'll tell you is also part of, of that inspiration that was brought to me by the work of those amazing people. So a bit of the background uh, of what brings me here. And uh, in the last few years I've been involved in, in this rising field of impact investing, which is to some, for me, a bit of a complement to social entrepreneurship, is the way to mainstream and finance the work of social entrepreneurs throughout the world. Now, what I'd like to do um, is, so give you, to some levels, a very um, simple and general context to the emergence of impact investing and some of the definition of impact investing and, and what it can bring to us in terms of poverty alleviation and um, a, a better society. But I also want to be very a bit provocative because I think it's an audience that we can be provoked to think differently about some of these issues. So I'm, I'd like to challenge some of our prejudices that I myself hold uh, about the role of profit, maybe the role of market in poverty alleviation discuss a bit what is the meaning of sustainability uh, in this context, uh, discuss the good and bad outcomes and what are we rewarding in our society, and then offer a bit of a menu of impact investing that came in different flavors, different types, as a way to open up the discussion for the remaining panels and discussions. Now, we have for many years organized our societies in sectors. And we have the public sector, um, the commercial enterprise sector, and what some called, I think, badly named the third sector, but I would like to call the charity and the social economy sector. And each of these sectors in, in the economy, uh, in, in society, are backed by a pool of funds, a pool of resources that support them. And to some extent, for the public sector, we have the public sector budgets and international development budgets commercial investable financial assets that are invested through private equity and other means into commercial enterprise. And we have philanthropic funds that are continuously renewed and also foundations and endowments that support the work of the charity sector and the social economy. And this is, of course, there are links between sectors. There's public-private partnerships. Uh, there is links between uh, philanthropic activities and commercial, but to a large extent we have organized in, in sectors, and I would say the relief and, and philanthropic action of the church is a fundamental element of this charity and social economy. Now, what has happened in the last 10 or 15 years? I think we are seeing some important trends happening in our societies. On one hand, and if you compare, uh, this is not at scale, but the size of the circles transmits a bit the trends that we are seeing in our society. And to some extent, the public sector budgets and international development are getting smaller. 
smaller for a different set of reasons. Not so much that there's less money in governments, but the money is more constrained and locked into obligations that are long-term into pension and social welfare. So less of it is actually uh, be a, being able to uh, be allocated to productive activities in society. Um, at the same time, the commercial investable financial assets have been growing 20-30% per year and now amounts to hundreds of trillions of dollars. A huge amount of funds, the wealth accumulated in our societies over many years, which funds commercial enterprises which have also been developing greatly and it's now the backbone of our economy and society. The philanthropic funds and foundation endowments, they have still remained important also because of a new wave of philanthropy. A lot of the wealthy people have been created a new wave of, of, of philanthropy, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Omidar Network, I know there's some representatives here. We have tried to, to find new ways of doing philanthropy, so that has hold its, uh, its highs. But this is a, a fundamental transformation in the last 20 years. And the size and scale of multinational companies, the size and scale of financial markets, the power of the commercial enterprise is huge in our society. And some people may see that as a problem, others as an opportunity. And I'm an entrepreneur, entrepreneurs always look at opportunities. What's the opportunity we have to leverage some of these expertise and resources that are here for outcomes that we will care about in terms of poverty alleviation and societal benefit. Now just to give you a sense of some of these potential here, uh, my country, Portugal, has been going through a very deep austerity and crisis, and we cannot pay our debt. So we have 130% of GDP in debt, about $150 billion, and we probably will take 30 years to pay that debt. Now, one American company, Apple Corporation, has in outside US an amount of money in cash and deposits, which is $160 billion. So one company, American, outside America, has more money than the entire debt of a country of 10 million people. So that's kind of striking number, just a sense of the power of companies and the power of the financial markets these days. Now, there have been also some interesting trends. Uh, usually, these financial assets, the commercial investable financial assets, were invested in an equation of risk and return. Given the risk I'm willing to take, given the longevity in which I want to make an investment, what's the best return portfolio that I can create? An important concept, as you know, is diversification, having a bit of different things so that we don't get hit in terms of our returns. But what is the best return that we can get for a certain level of risk we are willing to take? Now, that equation has changed somewhat in the last few years with the rise of this new uh, subfield of financial markets called social responsible investing. And social responsible investing is different from impact investing, but it's part of a trend of changing how financial markets work. And social responsible investing was a way of saying, well, we want to invest, but we want to invest making sure that our investments are good or at least are not bad, are not leading to bad outcomes. So let's take out of our portfolios things that we know to be negative for the world. Tobacco, firearms, alcohol, other gambling, other things. And let's restrict our portfolios to things that are deemed to be good and generate value for society. Um, and that still started small, and there's a few pioneers here from Calvert and other organizations. Uh, mostly with the negative screening, let's weed out the bad things and build our portfolios only with the things that are good or at least that we see as creating value for society. Over the years, this field has also evolved from like a pure negative screening. Now it's becoming a, a bit more, more interesting. It's looking at uh, uh, how good are the economic and social governance, environmental social governance of different organizations. Let's try to match them into a set of criteria. Let's try to uphold them to a certain level of responsibility and we'll choose the best of the breeds, the best in class. So that social responsible investing has grown to maybe represent 10 or 15% of all assets invested in the world right now, which is a tremendous achievement over the last 10 or 15 years. But what we're talking about here is not so much about weeding out the negative things or choosing among the best. 
is about purposefully seeking positive impact. How can we invest in activities that are meant for purposeful impact? Now, in these, I think it's interesting, following Cardinal Turkson's words, to go back to, um, but, so before that, just one last word about, in the last 10 or 15 years, there's also a rise of a new field called social entrepreneurship. And that new field is a bit cross-sector. There are social entrepreneurs coming from companies, trying to build social impact initiatives inside companies or in connection to business. There are people in philanthropy and, uh, and, and charities that are innovating, finding new ways that are more sustainable to solve societal problems. And there are people, uh, people also in the government trying to find new solutions. So these social entrepreneurs are really individuals that care about impact in the world and they look at neglected problems in society that markets cannot deal with and governments are not paying attention and they try to find sustainable solutions that can scale to these problems. This is a small area that has been growing a lot and being an engine of innovation across different sectors, which is an interesting development. So this is a bit of the context in which I would like to discuss um, a bit more the motivation for, uh, for impact investing, uh, which is because of this dissatisfaction of the financial system in allocating resources. In a sense, we are building a capitalism, and I think in the wake of the recent financial crisis, where despite a lot of progress being made by businesses in achieving economic and social progress, we see a rise of inequality. And it has been kind of shown in recent analysis and recent evidence, inequality is rising in our societies. We are, in the Western world, somewhat losing the middle class. We are getting a small tier of very wealthy and individuals, and a lot of people falling back into poverty. In the developing world, we have a lot of poverty that's hard to tackle with the means we have at our disposal. And we also see a lot of social exclusion. The markets work well, but not for everyone. There are always 8, 10, 15% of people that somehow find themselves in the fringes, in the exclusion of the markets and the market mechanisms. And so those are things that are troubling for us. And it seems that the financial system is not necessarily allocating resources in the best way. We trusted the financial system to be a way to allocate resources and diversify risk. Instead, in the crisis, we saw that it was actually misallocating resources and concentrating risk. And so we asked ourselves, what's the purpose of this financial system if it's not leading to societal progress? At the same time, there is, I would say, a bit of dissatisfaction with the sustainability of our charitable interventions. Uh, how can we sustain some of our activities? Are we making a difference and, and building capacity in the systems that we try to support? Or are we building sometimes dependency? How can we change the way that we approach the charity work to be more impactful and more sustainable? And at the same time, I would say increasing dissatisfaction with the public sector and the ability of governments to solve these problems of poverty and social exclusion. Uh, now, to some extent, the broader mandate for impact investing would be to pursue higher effectiveness in capital allocation, to really do what the financial system was supposed to do, to allocate resources to the most productive areas in society, <coughs> thus making all of us better off. And I would say that it's not that impact investors know better, but they can identify and support those who do, usually people on the ground close to the problems that are entrepreneurial, are innovative, and are coming up with the solutions. So for me, impact investing is a supporter, a leverager, a, 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 the financing of these social entrepreneurs and social innovators that across sectors, charity, business, and government are trying to make a difference. And taking some of these models and innovations at scale is a purpose that impact investing can achieve and have the resources to achieve. Now, I'd like to uh, bring back the words of his Holiness Pope Francis, addressing the World Economic Forum. Because for me, that work in business, those words were particularly powerful and particularly particular for relevant. So in the context of the Evangelii Gaudium exhortation, and in addressing the World Economic Forum meeting of 2014, 
uh, the Pope Francis wrote a message to the members of the forum. And there are some interesting things here, and I will highlight a few areas. It's recognizing the fundamental role that modern business has in achieving progress, both economic and social. And yet, highlighting the widespread social exclusion and inequality that's still happening in our societies. It's saying that business and finance has to be part of the solution. But at the same time, concern that the action of the business people uh, sometimes seems to have a bit of an, an afterthought for impact and for social progress and social inclusion. Um, and he says, those working in these sectors have a precise responsibility towards others, particularly those who are most frail, weak, and vulnerable. And I particularly like these words, precise responsibility. It's not a general responsibility. It's a precise responsibility, which means that we need to have precise actions and interventions to address those issues. And after describing some of those issues, he says, these words are forceful and dramatic, but it's, they are a challenge to us, to this assembly at the forum, to make a difference. In fact, those who have demonstrated their aptitude for being innovative and for improving the lives of many people by their ingenuity and professional expertise can further contribute by putting their skills at the service of those who are still living in their poverty. Because business and the financial sector not only holds the resources, but it's also a magnet and a tractor for some of the most talented people, both young and <coughs> old, that we have in our societies. And those talented, ingenious, knowledgeable, innovative people are a huge resource for the task at hand, which is social progress, social inclusion, poverty alleviation. Now, what is needed then is a renewed, profound, and broadened sense of responsibility on the part of all. Business is, in fact, a vocation, and a noble vocation, provided that those engaged in it see themselves challenged by a greater meaning in life. These are profound words, words um, and I think acknowledging that business is a noble vocation is powerful, and the, the fact that we need to be challenged by a, a higher meaning, a greater meaning in life. And I see this as I talk to my students, both like the MBA students at INSEAD, the executive, uh, executives that I, that I teach in, in the programs. Um, people in business are looking to be challenged with meaning. At some point, many of my MBA students are my age, they are early 40s, and they are saying, I'm successful in my companies, I'm doing well in my career, but that's not enough. I need something else. I'm looking for meaning in my life. I'm looking for a different kind of challenge that I cannot find only by focusing on profit maximization or on going up the corporate ladder. And for many years, I think we organized a society when we said, in business, you pursue your self-interest and the interest of your organization. And then in your religious life, in your family life, you can have regard for others. But in business, that's how you behave. And most people are saying, I'm a whole person. I'm not two people in business and in, in my family or religious life. I'm a whole person. And as a whole person, I want to have both kind of commercially viable and impactful career at the same time as I achieve meaning because I see the impact that I can create through business. And so I think the business sector is ready to be challenged, is being challenged, and the people here want to find ways of balancing this meaning in life with their requirements in their job. And that's how can we better do that? That's what we are here to discuss for these coming days. Now, those were profound words that I think will, will shape uh, the remaining of our discussion. So I think a vision for what I call a convergent economy is an economy that is not divided in sectors, where the public sector cares about the collective goods and the public goods. They are the private interests, and here the individual uh, well-being and social inclusion. I think we are looking for a convergent economy where this area and the spirit of social entrepreneurship grows 
and becomes a uniting force that unites the different kind of motivations of the different sectors and creates sustainable, scalable solutions to the challenges that we have in our societies. I think that's the vision, that's the mandate. And as I said, impact investing can be a powerful fuel, a powerful way to mainstream all of the <coughs> work of entrepreneurs and innovators. So now for some definitions. I would say the purposeful allocation of financial resources and knowledge as well to initiatives that can deliver measurable societal impact. And when I say societal, both social and environmental, I usually integrate both, alongside financial return. Now, I think a key word is here is measurable. We know that all productive investments have impact. They create jobs, they, uh, they build new products and services, but here is can I measure specifically the impact of my investments, of what I'm achieving? Because if I cannot measure it, I cannot manage it. I cannot decide where to allocate resources. So can I allocate the resources to areas with significant impact beyond what would normally be achieved in a market transaction? And can I do that without compromising my return or having a level of return that is adequate to my ambitions and my objectives. And that is impact investing. There are some, I believe, principles in all impact investing. Uh, one is this idea of investing in sustainable solutions. Solutions that pay for themselves. And because they pay for themselves, they're not dependent always on charity or at least on bringing resources from the outside. The solution can mobilize by the model, the business model that it has, the resources to continue over the long term and to grow. It's the idea of supporting models that can scale. We have wonderful innovations at local level that cannot scale. I think impact investors are looking for those models that can scale and that local innovation can, became, can become a broader solution for a major societal problem. This idea of rewarding the right things, paying for success, incentivizing and rewarding the positive outcomes. And for that, we need to be able to identify them and be able to measure, but create incentive systems that actually reward the positive things that we want to achieve. And that doesn't always happen in capitalism, and I will discuss that a bit later. And this is an important element of impact investing. Another important <coughs> element which is a bit more debatable and a bit more difficult to achieve is this idea of pursuing an alignment between profit and impact. And in that sense, trying to avoid this idea that you have to compromise and say, well, if I want to have impact, I'll have a much lower return. It's trying to, as earlier was said, to have the cake and eat it too. Can we find the best of both worlds without being naive? without saying it's easy. We know it's difficult, but in what situations, in what segments, in what, with what business models, is it possible to find this alignment between profit and impact? And if we do, then impact investing can work and does not need to compromise on returns. And if we do that, then the amount of financial resource we can uh, allocate to impact investing is huge. It's the hundreds of trillions there. And that could really make a dent in some fundamental problems. Now, this idea of having no compromise, it's open to debate. And I think we will debate it throughout this conference. So here I'd like to be uh, challenging, provocative, and try to maybe break some prejudices. Okay? And now I'm going to enter, I know, in dangerous territory. So let me, let's have some thought experiments here. Uh, I was recently in Brazil uh, last month, and we were launching the National Task Force on Social Finance and Impact Business. An amazing gathering, about 500 people, and the potential for social business in Brazil is huge. I was quite impressed by being there. So I, I chose, it's a fictitious example, 
but close to something I saw in Brazil. Right? So Chico, an entrepreneur in Brazil, developed an innovative software solution to teach English to affluent school kids from the cities. The business he founded and leads helped more than 2 million clients learn English and enter university. He received 1 million in salary last year as a founder and CEO of this organization. Now, let me ask you, 1 million is a lot of money. Is it ethical for a founder and entrepreneur of a business to receive a 1 million salary? What do you think? Think about it for a minute. He probably could live well with 100,000, 50,000, but he's receiving 1 million. Should he? Is it ethical to do so? So I'm going to ask you for a hands up if you think that it's ethical for someone like him, who is an entrepreneur, who innovated, who created a business that has an impact in the world, to receive one million. So who thinks it's... Okay, Let's say the majority of the room believes that it's ethical, it's fair to reward those who innovate, those who are different and are able to create a difference for others as well. And he clearly achieved a lot of impact and has clients paying for the solution and generating benefits. Now, let me ask you for another example. João, an entrepreneur from Brazil, developed an innovative, uh, an innovative software solution to teach English to poor kids from the favelas. The charity he founded and leads helped more than 2 million beneficiaries learn English and enter university. He received $1 million last year in salary. <laughs> this is trickier. Now, the same question. Do you think it's ethical? Is it fair for João, this entrepreneur, who built this charity to help the poor kids in the favelas who have no opportunities? to teach them how English and help them enter university, is it fair, ethical for him to receive one million? What do you think? Hands in the air if you think so. I see a few hands, but much fewer, about half the hands. Now, let me continue this example a bit longer. So these are the two cases I just gave you, and they are very similar except one built a business, one is a charity, one is focusing on the affluent school kids, the other on the poor kids. Now, who do you think has the harder task? Who has the hardest day-to-day -day, uh, in terms of finding the right business model, in terms of creating value, in terms of finding solutions? Who has the harder task? The ones serving the clients that can pay, that are in the city, or the ones serving the poor kids in the favelas? The second. The second. Now, who do you think is creating more value for society? The one that's helping rich kids have a higher chance to enter university and learn English? Or the one who is doing that work with poor kids that have fewer options in life, that probably will end up being criminals in gangs if they don't go to university or if they are not included? Who is creating more impact, more value for society among the two? The second one, clearly, as well. So what are we saying? We are saying that the person that has the hardest challenge and works harder and needs to be more innovative, the person that is actually creating more impact and more value in society deserves less or it's ethical for him to be paid less compared to the other. And that's a tough prejudice. But it's one that I myself hold because I probably would vote no, for the second as well. But that's the norms of our society. But Philip, you said he founded a charity. You didn't say he founded a business. Yes. So I was focused on that. Yes. Does a charity have different tax structures? And True. Uh, but I, I didn't say that he was paying a dividend, which you, he could not. I would say he was getting a salary. And of course, this is a fictitious example to provoke you, right? But the main <laughs> point is, what he did. why... Why do we have this prejudice? Why do we feel like that? What's the source of this sentiment? Because if you can analyze the source, 
maybe we can explore it and see if it makes sense or not. And as I thought about this, there are different reasons for this, which have their uh, rationale. One is to say it is wrong to make money from the poor. If we are doing poverty alleviation, it's wrong to pay yourself a rich reward. Now, I think sometimes the words we use have connotations. He's not making money from the poor, he's making money from serving the poor, which is different. But the corollary or the implication of this is that we are building a society <coughs> that is rewards better those that serve the rich compared to those that serve the poor. And if we build this kind of society, what happens is that we have huge sectors of wealth management and luxury goods because it's okay to make money serving the rich, but those that try to make money serving the poor then have, are required to have a much lower bar of reward. And, and this is personal uh, for me because I see hundreds of social entrepreneurs doing an amazing work. If they were building a for-profit business, they would be mil millionaires. But because they are not, they are trying to think, can I put my child into university or not? So those are some of the best and brightest minds we have in business. Social entrepreneurs, innovative, giving away to others. And they are concerned about making ends meet because they don't make enough. And I feel that, can we find, if we reward less for serving the poor, can we find 10 people to serve the poor? Yes, we can. 500? Yes, we can. 10,000? Yes, we can. 1 million? At some point, the incentive structure in our society will make some of our brightest minds and most innovative people to go to the sectors where they can have a good living, as opposed to one that is hard to make ends meet. And so there is a danger to this corollary, which is we make it more beneficial to serve the rich than the poor, and what we want is to better serve the poor. Now, there, there could be other arguments, and, and I can be challenged on them, but one argument is, well, but be careful. The poor are weaker and should be protected. And it's a slippery slope. Once we start allowing profits to be made by serving the poor, this will escalate, and suddenly we'll be exploiting the poor. Now, here, I think that a lot of what we learn in decades of trying to do base of the pyramid work, in which trying to serve the poor with commercial models, is that poor people actually want to be treated as customers. They may have only $2 per day, or maybe only $4 per day to spend, but with those $4 per day, they have a choice. And they can allocate those choices to areas that are their preference, or that create more value for them and for their families. And sometimes, I think we may be condescending and say, well, but they don't make the right choices. For example, they may buy the satellite dish to have TV at home and see soccer games, as opposed to put food on the table. True, and sometimes people don't make good choices. But I would say that the ability to make bad choices is evenly distributed across poor and rich people. <laughs> I see rich kids going to a bar and do binge drinking and then driving. <coughs> That's a stupid, crazy choice. It's bad for them, but they still do it. So I think the, uh, making bad decisions is, happens across the board. We need to do mentoring and coaching and to have some interventions for people that are making bad decisions, but it's not necessarily that the poor are weak and cannot decide. They have aspirations, they allocate their resources, they balance their family's economies, and, and the issue that the poor have, which is very unfair, Something some that's called the poverty tax. Often, poor people, especially in developing countries, don't have access to the things that we take for granted. Water, electricity, communications, you name it. And when they have access to it, they pay for it two or three or five times more than we pay. So they may only have like four dollars a day, but their kilowatt of energy is more expensive than the one we pay in our homes. And that is what's wrong. And I think commercial mechanisms can actually try to take away that poverty tax, to give the people in poverty the opportunity to improve themselves, the opportunity to allocate their choices in the right way, and to improve their lives. And that's, I think, the potential that um, uh, markets can bring in poverty alleviation. And just 
And sometimes, and I'm also guilty of this prejudice, there was a moment when I realized how prejudiced, uh, how prejudiced I was. Uh, in, in Portugal, I worked a lot, I built an institute for social entrepreneurship in Portugal, we have different programs. And in one of the programs, there was um, uh, an institution that uh, deals and tries to include people with mental disabilities. And they have, they have like a, a gardening, uh, where the, the clients of, of, the, of the facility, uh, the people with mental disability, would be the gardeners that would take care of the garden and produce crops and vegetables and fruits. And they were, they were saying, this is a way to give them meaningful employment uh, and so they can have a, a salary, they can pay and, and, and feel themselves contributors. And at some point they were showing a video of one of these men speaking. And somehow I expect him to say, it's so, and, and just for context, because this institution cannot profit from, the, uh, uh, from employing these people, all the, all the produce that is produced in that garden is actually given away or either consumed internally in the institution or given away to charities to be given away to the poor. And so I was expecting this man to say, I'm so thankful for having a job and to feel uh, meaning. And then he, he said, uh, I'm very happy to have this job because it gives me the opportunity to help other people. I know that the produce of this garden is being given away to charity and so I'm helping the poor people in those charities and I'm very happy for that. And I said, that's not what I expected to hear. But his aspirations are exactly the same as mine. He wanted to be kind of helping other people who were poor. And he had a sense of himself that was totally different from the perspective I had of him. And so I think sometimes we often have these preconceptions about poor people or people that are disadvantaged. And we all need to be hit with these things on the face to say, there is a way so poor people have options, have choices, have income, have decisions to allocate. And if we can create fair markets that give them the products and services they need, poverty can be alleviated. And I think we have evidence of that in m many years of work. And that's part of this idea of commercial market-based solutions for alleviating poverty. Now, there could be a third uh, reasoning for this prejudice, which is uh, probably a more difficult one to address, which is saying, well, the profit motivation will get into the system and at some point will force a compromise for lower impact. And that can happen. Uh, and, and I just wanted to touch upon this relatively quickly, but there is a tale of microcredits. Microfinance in Bangladesh, developed by uh, Grameen Bank and by Brack and others in the late 70s, uh, a way to provide small loans to the, to the poor, especially women, for empowering them to, to become micro-entrepreneurs. Uh, that had, has proven to have had uh, a strong impact in poverty alleviation. There are some recent studies that suggest that when it was implemented, well, especially not only by creating micro-entrepreneurs, but by helping those people uh, use the surplus of those activities for uh, food and nutrition and education for the family, that had an impact on poverty alleviation. In India, it was, the, it was replicated in India as a commercial proposition with no social mission lock. And in, in India, it went bad. So basically, people tried to grow very fast revenues, uh, independent of impact. It created a, kind of a, um, a cycle of boom and bust. Many people went bankrupt. People committed suicide. And so it, it was, so it can happen that the profit motivation when we, with no restriction, can actually lead to bad outcomes. So we need to be careful for that. But still we have, and I'll come back to that a bit later, but what I would say is that there is a choice for us to make in business to find these areas of high alignment where profit is clearly aligned with impact. And those areas are areas where something that economists call value spillovers. The benefit does not accrue only to the individual, but also accrues to society. There are spillovers of value to society. In those areas, markets uh, don't work very well in a strict commercial mindset. So an impact mindset can make those markets work better. And so areas of education, health, housing, food, employment, creation, are areas where we find these value spillovers. So when you are educated, not only you benefit yourself, but you benefit society through your work. So those are areas where an impact mentality can actually improve over traditional commercial mentality. Access to infrastructure, 
destroying this poverty tax that prevents pe people who are poor from improving themselves. <coughs> Energy, water, transport, communication, finance. Those are key areas for impact investment. And also, focus on clients who are excluded or disadvantaged, for whom markets are not paying attention because it's hard to make a profit, but where opportunities for value creation lie and exist. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that. So an example where I believe a business model was designed for perfect alignment is this case that I think will be discussed later by the LeapFrog. It's one company invested by LeapFrog. Microinsurance for HIV positive in South Africa. In this case, there was a segment of the population that was excluded. HIV incidence in South Africa is among the highest in the world due to bad policies for many years, bad public policies. And so these people not only were faced with HIV positive, but they could not have insurance, they could not buy a house, they could not have a normal life because the systems around them were discriminating against them. Now, this company says, let me create a for-profit microinsurance policy for these people because they deserve to be able to buy a house, to have a life insurance, to be able to find a job. And so they created a microinsurance policy for HIV positive patients. Uh, and interestingly, they made it profitable, but there is an alignment in the business model. So through education, they can improve the health and well-being of people with HIV uh, because they, they will take their medication regularly. And if they do take the medication regularly, they'll have a discount in the insurance policy. But because of that, they have better health outcomes and they don't ask for claims later. So in this case, the more policies they sell and the more outcomes, positive outcomes they create on the well-being of their clients, the fewer claims they will have and the more money they'll make. So there's a strong alignment between profit and impact in this model, which is a perfect model to be grown and scaled through impact investing. And so I would say that in many cases, finding this alignment is a question of business model innovation and designing the right model, the right company, in the right way. That's why we need the work of social entrepreneurs who come up with these innovations and impact investors that will support these innovations. So because of time, I'll go a bit faster. Now, let me just... Another thought-provoking example for you. You invested last year 10,000 euros in a business in Italy that served the elderly by building and managing retirement homes. They found an innovative way to cut costs while maintaining the quality of care and made 10 million in profits that year. They asked you for more capital to grow. If you are an investor, a normal investor, faced with this situation, would you invest more? Yes. Well, they use the money well, they found a way to innovate, they are profitable, they want to grow. What? Of course, why not? Another example. You donated 10,000 euros last year to a charity in Italy that served the elderly by building and managing retirement homes. They found an innovative way to cut costs while maintaining the quality of care and made 10 million euros of profits that year. They ask you for more donations to grow. You are a donor. What would you say now? You probably say, well, they probably don't need my money anymore. They are profitable, and should they be profitable? They are a charity, but they are profitable, they have a surplus. So maybe I'll use my money elsewhere. So what we are seeing in our society is a situation in which the for-profit commercial businesses have money to grow and scale, but the successful charities and social enterprises that care about impact and care to be sustainable are starved of financing at their mezzanine stage, at their mid-level of growth, because people in charity say you don't need this anymore, and people in commercial investment say, well, you don't quite make the bar for the kind of things we invest in. And that's exactly the gap that impact investing can pursue, can identify those commercially viable models that can grow and that are starved by resources from other sectors and allocate and help those organizations grow to create a stronger, more resilient social economy sector. Now, because the basic principle is that an organization that's not able to provide a fair reward to its key resource providers <coughs> is in a path of self-destruction. We usually have 
a bad sense about profit. But profit is no more or less than the reward to the equity capital providers or to the entrepreneurial talent for a job well done. It's similar to salary being the reward for labor, interest to reward for loans, market price to reward for suppliers, emotional benefits to reward for volunteers. There's no reason to have a bad image or connotation of profit. It's just the reward for equity capital and entrepreneurial talent. To the extent that equity capital and entrepreneurial talent is important, being profitable and providing a return is fundamental, or else we won't be able to uh, scale and innovate in these organizations. Now, for a charity that cannot pay dividends, and rightly so, accumulated profit is actually one of the best sources of long-term capital, and will lead to organizational strength and re resilience, because a key issue for charities and social enterprises is their lack of capital. They usually don't have endowments or the benefit of endowments. And so the fact that for me a charity is profitable is amazingly good news. And we should reward the surplus of social enterprise and charity because they are a potential source of, of capital for the future. Now, but then you say, but then is everything the same? What's the difference between a commercial company and an impact company? And I would say, there's a second principle of sustainability, not only the internal sustainability of the model, but the sustainability of the impact that we create on society. A business is only truly sustainable when it is designed to create positive impact for its clients and key stakeholders. Uh, so for me, an impact business and the defining element of an impact business is this overriding concern with sustainability of our creation for the stakeholders or for the planet. For example, a tobacco company is not an impact business in any definition. Why? Because all of them can be sustainable internally. What the, the product that they are selling is known to create a negative impact on their clients. They may wish to buy it, and, that's, and it's a free market, they can buy it, and people can make profits. But it's actually creating a, ne a negative impact. What we want to reward and look for is for those organizations that are actually having a tremendous positive impact a sustainability, a second order of sustainability in the clients and stakeholders and the environment as well. And those are the businesses where profit, long-term profit, is aligned with impact and should be the recipients of impact investment. Okay. Now, just, I have five more minutes and I will end on time. But an important point about outcomes and about measuring of impact. Now, this is a bold statement, but I believe in it. People often say, if you reward something with a lot of money, bad things will happen. But what I see is that everything bad that happens in the economy or markets happens not because we reward people generously, but because we start rewarding the wrong outcomes. And as we do that, we destroy the system. For example, we reward revenue growth, as opposed to value creation of profits. And when we do that, we may actually be destroying value. And that's what happened in microfinance in India, where people were rewarded for selling more loans. And actually, that's the source of the crisis as well, as opposed to being rewarded for creating value. Or we reward people for short-term profits or asset appreciation, which builds speculation and eventually value destruction. Or, and this is tougher, we reward people for stock price increases. And why is this bad? Because the stock price is not the value of the company. It's the perception of the value of the company. And it's much easier for a manager to influence the perception of value as opposed to really create value. So when we put all our efforts on rewarding stock pr price increases, we actually send a signal to management to start behaving in a way that increases the perception of value as opposed to the harder task of really creating value. And so I think what, and I could continue, but I think what we should do is really have a clear sense of what we are rewarding, what outcomes we want to achieve, being able to measure them uh, in a rigorous way, and then I don't mind rewarding them generously. Okay. And now, and this, so the promise of impact investing, and this is my last point, depends on our ability to make progress in really reliably measuring the impact and achieving comparability of outcomes. 
And some people react to that by saying that you cannot monetize everything, you cannot monetize the value of life. And I agree. So it's not about that. It's about comparability of outcomes. It's about saying, for example, doing a study and saying, well, charity A is capable of saving 1,000 lives in their original intervention at the cost of 2,000, with 80% success in a particular medical intervention. Charity B can save 100 lives, it operates at local level, at the cost of 1,000, with 90% success. And the dominant public solution, let's say the public hospital, has a cost of 5,000 per intervention at 60% success. Once we are able to measure the impact, that if the impact that we care about is saving the life, and attribute a cost to this impact, then we can make management. Then we can say, okay, can we, for example, try to study what is happening at this charity? Why are they so effective? Can they scale their local intervention and build a federation of local hubs? Or can something that they do be merged with something that Charity A is doing in terms of their solution so that we lower a bit the cost of Charity A, which has something that can scale. And if we prove that this can be done, can we approach the government and say, look, we have a better solution than you have. Let us prove to you that the solution is better. We will do an intervention, we will prove and measure the outcomes, and we'll show you that you can actually do the saving of the life at a higher success at a lower cost. And if we prove that we can do it, you pay as a return. If we fail to do it, then we lose our money. And that's exactly an innovation that has been developed, which is the impact bond. It's a way to bring innovation <coughs> to the public sector by creating basically a consortium of private investors with social innovators that have a better solution than the government and basically saying, if we prove that it works, you will pay it because we'll save money. Because you save 4,000 in each of the interventions. So with the amount that you're going to save, you'll pay as a return, which can be even a market-based return. But the risk is on us. We will prove that it works. If it doesn't work, you don't invest any money from the public budgets. If it works, you pay as a return. And actually, then you can actually bring the insight and knowledge that we develop here to your public solution to grow it at national scale. And that's another form of impact investing, which is called the impact bond. And we have Sir Ronald Cohen here, who is one of the uh, people who have developed these innovations in the UK. Uh, and this is my last point, which is one size does not fit all. We do have different flavors and financial innovations in impact investing. And for problems that can be better addressed through market mechanisms, the impact investing funds which invest in social entrepreneurs, social innovators, and try to grow and scale their uh, organizations, it's a good model. It has been proven to work well and provide a return. For societal problems that are typically the purview of public authorities, public goods, the social impact bonds are a good way of infusing innovation, infusing new ways of working in the public sector. For those interventions that involve marginal segments of the population who are severely excluded and for which markets don't make sense, but they are, too, um, they are too much of a minority for governments to, to care about in the public policy. That's the purview of charitable services. There's a new way also of thinking about charity, which is the venture philanthropy, which is again finding the social entrepreneurs that are innovating, hand holding them over time, building their organizations, not for a commercial return, but for a measured impact return. So there are different flavors. Uh, in impact investing. We are, I think we'll discuss some of them. I wanted to challenge you with the airs of perfect alignment, but sometimes we need different types of interventions. And so my vision for impact investing is a growing sector of social entrepreneurs and innovators that bridges the different sectors of society. And impact investing has the fuel, has the mainstreaming of this new sector of social innovators that come across all, all the sectors. So, and there we can have different innovations. I'm listing three. Many more innovations are coming from entrepreneurs within the impact investing sector, which are coming up with new financial instruments, with new financial mechanisms, and I'm sure we'll be discussing many of them during this session. Now, the final thing, and Ryan is looking at me, is saying there's a promising role for the Catholic Church to play in this endeavor. Um, and I won't, the potential is so huge and so obvious that I won't discuss it now and it will not be for me to discuss it. 
but we will discuss it, I'm sure, for the next two days. But just to say, I looked at a few numbers, 1.2 billion members of the church, running 24% of the medical sector in the world, uh, education as well. So the tremendous, the power that you have, we have people all over the world that understand poverty and poverty alleviation. There's no words to describe the potential that this discussion can have. So I'm really uh, pleased to be here. And thank you for the opportunity to address uh, the conference. And I'm really excited for the next two, uh, two days to come. Thank you very much.